With a serious effort, James Bond bent his attention once more on the little yellow book in his hand. James let the little book close, and, raising his head, gazed out over a blue expanse of ocean. A horrible suspicion assailed him that he was not a strong man. A strong man would have been in command of the present situation, not a victim to it. The sixtieth time that morning, James rehearsed his wrongs. Ah, so this is the Raja's Emerald. Hmm. The Raja's Emerald, a short story starring James Bond by... Agatha Christie? What? Okay, this isn't actually the Queen of Crime writing about 007 on Her Majesty's Secret Service, though she did write her own spy thrillers. But this is a short story written by her, with a protagonist named James Bond, and while it isn't a Bond continuation story, the funny thing is we probably wouldn't have one without the other. But we'll get to that. First, let's look at the story itself. James Bond is a young man on holiday at the fashionable coastal resort of Kimpton-on-Sea, with the woman he loves, Grace. Though decorum dictates he and Grace stay in separate accommodation, his means heighten the separation, placing him in a cheap boarding house while she stays in the high-class Esplanade Hotel on the waterfront. And worse, apparent fellow suitor Claude Sopworth and his three sisters are also at the Esplanade. In their presence, James feels constantly socially isolated, belittled for his clothes and greater physical distance from Grace, who seems embarrassed by him around her friends. The difference in means also confronts James with a true British nemesis, queuing. First, there's an hour-long wait to get to the beach the others have direct access to from their expensive hotel, and then there's the wait time of food at the cheaper restaurant he must patronise. He gets around the first one by getting changed in an unlocked private hut belonging to one of the large private villas in the resort, where he is almost caught by the real owners when changing back. And once seated at the cheap cafe, James is astounded to find a large emerald in his pocket. After seeing a recent edition of the resort's newspaper, he realises he must be in possession of the emerald reported stolen by the Rajah of Mariputna, who is staying at Lord Edward Campion's private villa. James must have put on the wrong trousers when hastily changing back at what turns out to have been Lord Campion's beach hut. It's the wrong trousers! The wrong trousers! Wondering why a priceless emerald was left in a beach hut in the first place, he goes back to the hut to surreptitiously change back into his own trousers. Whoa! It's the wrong trousers, Gromit, and they've gone wrong! But there he is confronted by a man who identifies himself as Detective Inspector Merrilees of Scotland Yard, on the track of the Emerald, and with a badge to prove it. James tries to buy himself time by claiming that the Emerald is at his lodging, so the policeman decides to take him by the arm back to his hotel. On the way they pass a police station, and James suddenly grabs the man and shouts for the police, claiming that Merrilees has picked his pocket. The police search Merrilees and find the Emerald, which Merrilees claims James put there, which is actually true even if the rest of his story is not. Caught between the two unsubstantiated claims, the police is saved by Lord Campion's arrival. He identifies Merrilees as Jones, the valet suspected of the theft from the off, who had bet on the rarely used hut trousers as a good hiding place until everything died down. In thanks, Lord Campion invites James to his villa for lunch with the Raja, and on the way there James Bond has the pleasure of being seen by, and turning down a half-hearted invitation from, Grace and the Sopworth siblings, in favour of the much more impressive, though similarly trousered, Lord and Raja. Now, as a James Bond story, well, of course, this isn't really a James Bond story. But this James Bond is a victim of snobbery rather than a perpetrator of it, speaks very little French instead of being fluent, and is not a man of action. In fact, the latter might be his greatest problem as a main character. He seems powerless to do anything other than complain until he breaks into the beach hut, and the story as a whole might have been more engaging if we had got to experience his attempt to put the jewel back into the criminal's pocket, and realise the man was lying about being a policeman, rather than being told after the fact that the badge that Jones showed him was for a cycling club that James recognised as he also happened to belong to it. Which is also a big coincidence to swallow this late in the game. It's not that we needed to see him in a physical fight, but having him complain less, or try to impress Grace more, might have made him more likeable, and the mystery elements later aren't enough for the story to work, as they mostly concern people we don't really know, and situations we haven't seen. A problem Christie evidently recognised as she refocused the story onto them when adapting it into the 1962 play Afternoon at the Seaside. Though one wonders if the release of the film version of Doctor No that same year might have also been partially responsible for this James Bond losing his protagonist status and his name. In short, the problem with the mystery is that it's not really mysterious, and this reader at least, 
did not buy for a second that James Bond was inadvertently responsible for this theft in the first place, meaning that the reader was ahead of the main character for a substantial portion of the story, and then only behind because of information he was not given. While this is undoubtedly not one of Christie's best stories, being merely okay, and that being a phenomenally high bar, its failures as a James Bond one are, of course, entirely irrelevant and totally unfair. The Raja's Emerald was first published in the UK in 1926, over 25 years before 007 was created, though funnily enough most American fans got to know the two characters in the opposite order, as the story didn't appear in a US anthology until 1971. But that is not to say the two characters are entirely unrelated. As I said at the start, the Raja's Emerald exists for the same reason that every one of the Bond continuation books exists, from Kingsley Amos's to Anthony Horowitz's and soon Kim Sherwood's. You see, the Fleming estate at the time of Fleming's death in 1964 wasn't convinced of the need for more books until legal advice told them the Bond character couldn't be copyrighted, due to the commonness of the name, which had been the very reason Fleming had chosen it in the first place. When I started to write these books in 1952, I wanted to find um, a name which wouldn't have any of the sort of romantic uh, overtones like Peregrine Carruthers or whatever it might be. I wanted a really flat, quiet name. And one of my Bibles out here is uh, James Bond's Birds of the West Indies, which is a very famous uh, ornithological book indeed. And I thought, well, now, James Bond, now that's a pretty quiet name. And so I simply stole it and used it. In the same way Agatha Christie had written a story about a James Bond, and a bird watcher could just be called James Bond and publish books under that name, there was nothing stopping anyone writing a story about James Bond, or even making that character a spy, as long as they didn't also use obvious Fleming inventions, such as a boss called M, a secretary called Moneypenny, and etc. So it was for this reason to retain their rights to Bond and avoid fans turning elsewhere for more of him, that Glid Rose decided to commission a sequel. Even then, it was somewhat reluctantly, in the case of Fleming's widow Anne, who wrote, Since Peter Fleming agrees to the counterfeit Bond, I am prepared to accept his judgement, though my distaste for the project is in no way altered. And evidently, she didn't get over these feelings, as she would then go on to write a damning review of the first Bond-centric continuation novel, Colonel Sun. In fact, it was so damning that the Sunday Telegraph, which had commissioned the piece, refused to publish it for fear of libel. Apparently, Anne hadn't even felt the need to read the book before reviewing it. But the story of Agatha Christie's James Bond story, and how it connects to the existence of the Bond continuation books as a whole, would have one final twist. If they as a whole partly exist due to the example provided by the Christie story, one in particular has an extra reason to be in debt to the Queen of Crime. Author Kim Sherwood has now taken the Agatha Christie connection full circle, as she apparently wrote part of the latest one, Double or Nothing, in Agatha Christie's house. For Sherwood's sake, we can only hope Christie's estate wasn't bitter about her character having been metaphorically rubbed out by Fleming's. Though ironically, Christie's lifestyle means her bond will be in copyright longer than Fleming's. <coughs>